morning, speaking with Dr. James Garner from Percheron Therapeutics this morning. James, good morning. Good morning. Great to speak to you, Andrew. Yeah, good to be catching up with you. Uh, look, firstly, James, give us an overview here on Percheron Therapeutics and your current focus. Thanks, Andrew. Well, look, Percheron is developing a drug called ATL1102. And this drug came out of a collaboration with a company called Ionis Pharmaceuticals in the United States, who's one of the world leaders in this technology area. So it's got a, a fantastic pedigree behind it. And the drug works by damping down the activity of the immune system. It's a class of drugs that we call immunomodulators. And this means that it's got potential applications across a whole range of different diseases. But for right now, we're focused very single-mindedly on a disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And this is a genetic disease of children. Essentially, it's a muscle wasting disease. It starts to become evident uh, around four or five years of age. Um, sad to say, children typically wheelchair bound by about 12, 13 years of age, and life expectancy is in the mid 20s. And it's almost exclusively a disease of boys. It's a relatively more common disease among all these, these genetic diseases of childhood. And although we have some treatments available, they really don't work great. They certainly are, are, are not a, a curative treatment by a very, very long margin. So there's a, there's a huge need for new therapies here. Now, our drug, ATL1102, has shown some really positive data in an earlier phase 2A study that we did in Australia. So we're now trying to confirm those results with a larger, more substantial phase 2B study. Hmm. And of course, you've had some news out recently from that clinical trial. Uh, James, just tell us a bit more, how's it going? Yes, look, Andrew, it's, it's going great. We have reached full enrollment to the study, which is a really important milestone in the conduct of the trial. Uh, we were shooting to get 45 patients. We actually ended up very slightly over that, and that's common in clinical trials. The, the patients who are in screening at the end, we, we allowed in, just held it open for a few extra days because the, the clinicians were very keen to get those last couple of patients in. But for investors, this means two things. First of all, it actually takes an enormous amount of operational risk out of this trial. More than a few clinical trials never complete enrollment for a whole host of reasons. The patients just aren't there. Uh, the, there's competing trials. The clinicians don't warm to the drug. Um, patients and families just find it not very tolerable. As soon as we're fully enrolled, many of those concerns go away. And so uh, this is a, a, an enormous de-risking event for this trial. But the second thing that it means for investors, which is much more important, is we are now on a path to data for this study. And we are going to see data by the end of calendar 2024 out of this trial. And that's not an aspiration. It's not a forecast. It's not an estimate. That's really hardwired into the design of the study. The primary endpoint is set uh, six months after completion of recruitment. So whether we like it or not, we're going to be seeing data by the end of the year. The clock is now ticking. And, uh, and that data could be absolutely transformative for the company. So it really sets us up for a very, very exciting fourth quarter. And so, what, James, how will that data guide Hersher on therapeutics in terms of further studies and further development? Well, look, several things. First thing to say is that the study won't quite be over at that point. So there, uh, although the primary endpoint is at six months, there's another readout at 12 months, and then the patients have four months off treatment. So we actually do get a couple more bites of the cherry in effect, and uh, we get a couple of extra opportunities to, to better understand the efficacy of the drug. So the study will continue into well into calendar 2025. But as the data emerges at the end of this year, potentially uh, in, in the new year, we'll be looking to put that data in front of regulatory agencies. And we'll be talking about it with partners, with advisors as well. And fundamentally, it's going to take us in one of a couple of different directions. If the data is really good, it may open the possibility of what we call accelerated approval. That means we're going to talk to FDA about getting the drug on the market now. This could see the drug launched conceivably within calendar 2025, more likely calendar 2026. Um, but given the unmet need in this disease, that's a, that's a very real possibility if the data supports it. Now, if it's not quite that good, it may position us for uh, 
uh, for a phase three study, a confirmatory study, but with positive data in hand, with with real confidence about how the drug performs, I think we'd be uh, you know we'd be very comfortable to to continue taking this drug forward and to collect that little bit of extra data that would get it across the finish line. So, long story short, we see where the data takes us, but I think uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of doors and a lot of possibilities open up. And look, just speaking of data, so you've had some animal toxicology results out recently also. Uh, just tell us a bit more about the significance of this. Yes, this was this was something FDA asked us to do as a prerequisite for performing clinical trials in the United States. And it's routine stuff. It's really just to understand the safety profile of the drug, but uh, it still takes about 18, 24 months to do. We, um, we have the bulk of that data in hand now. There's still a little bit more work to be done in the study, so we won't see the final data probably until the fourth quarter of 24. But we have most of it in. And to cut a very long story short, I think the message that's coming through is so far so good. Uh, the drug is not showing any unexpected toxicities. It seems to be broadly well tolerated by the animals. Um, really nothing that surprises us. And, and we weren't frankly expecting any surprises but it's very nice to have that confirmed and so in due course probably later this year or possibly beginning of next year we'll also be looking to put that data in front of fda and again i think that will open a lot of doors for us you mentioned partnering a bit earlier is there a chance it could happen before the data reader look absolutely um we uh we're very clear that we do see partners the way forward for the drug. We have no real aspiration to take this drug to market ourselves. So at some stage between now and a commercial launch, we'll be looking to partner with one or more larger companies. It's really just a question of when. Now, you know, there's, there's an argument that waiting for data makes the drug more valuable, but I think there's also at least an equally strong argument that a partner, a good partner, can bring enormous resources and capabilities to a program. So I think we remain, to some extent, agnostic. The right deal with the right partner, we would not hesitate to seize right now. And um, equally, if the partners that we're talking to decide to take a more conservative view and to wait until data, then we're not really faced by that. We can we can work with that and we can carry on under our own steam for the time being. We will be going to the bio conference at the beginning of June. It's the big partnering event of the year for, for biotech and pharmaceutical companies being held in San Diego, California. We've got an extremely busy schedule. So, um, so I think we'll have a much better sense coming out of that conference, just what the appetite looks like among among potential partners. Well, clearly big milestones, big catalysts ahead for the remainder of uh, 2024. How's your cash runway looking? How far will that take you? We've got cash uh, well into calendar 2025. So it sees us very nicely over this data readout uh, at the end of the year, which is great. Um, thereafter, I think there's a lot of possibilities. And uh, right now we're, we're just keeping every every iron in the fire, every, uh, every every possibility open. Obviously a partnering deal could substantially fund the company for, for some time. Um, obviously there's, there's always uh, access to capital markets. We do have some outstanding options which potentially could end up getting exercised. So there's, there's a whole range of possibilities here. And uh, I think we're, we're in the comfortable position that we've got money to, to see us through data and uh, we've got plenty of opportunities after that. Well, James, just before you take off this morning, give us a quick summary here of the Percheron investment case. Well, look, we're a, we're a late clinical stage company. Uh, we've got a drug that was developed in partnership with one of the very, very best companies in the business. It's shown positive clinical data already, and that data has been published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Uh, it's uh, it's addressing a potentially billion dollar market that's very poorly served by existing therapies. And we're going to get uh, a key data readout by the end of this year from a substantial international randomized controlled trial. So this is an incredibly exciting time for our company. Uh, there's no question it's gonna be a, a dramatic uh, second half of the year. And uh, hopefully with a, a little bit of wind in our sails, we can really make a difference for these kids and for their families. Absolutely. James, good to see you. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Andrew.